um, as I mentioned a little while ago, I kind of entitled the message um, the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3 versus the Nebuchadnezzar of Daniel chapter chapter 4. Um, I'm hoping that, well, I'm sure that the Lord will be, as he has done many, many times before, not as I'm concerned, but where everyone who preaches who has a connection to the Lord, it's always the Lord that works in whoever's surrendered to him, both to willing to do his good pleasure. And what's the Lord's good pleasure? <coughs> the people are saved. Um, Peter says, I think it's 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, that God is not slack as some men can't slap, can't slap us, but he's what? Long suffering to us would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what's the Lord's will and good pleasure? The people are saved. He's going to do all that he can. He's doing all that he can to ensure that people say, are saved. Um, but he can't force us, can he? That's the one thing that he can't do. He can't force you to accept him. If you get to heaven, this is something I often say, you'll get there because God loved you into heaven. His only weapon is love, because that's what he is. And God is love. Just going to have a little taste of this water so that my mouth doesn't dry. So the scripture readings were taken from two portions of the book of Daniel, and chapter 3 and verse 29. And we went from there to chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, we're going to look at Nebuchadnezzar, and after looking at him for a while, we'll compare him in his two states, if you, if you will, and maybe compare ourselves to the two Nebuchadnezzars described. And we maybe have to ask, which one are we? Are we the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3? Are we, the, are we the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 4? We look at what he maybe represents, who he maybe, rep maybe represents, so we have to ask, which one of him is, is us? Uh, which one of, which, which Nebuchadnezzar are we? <coughs> Let's look at the chapter 3 Nebuchadnezzar. I'll read again verse 29. Remember what's just happened. Fiery furnace, three Hebrew boys cast in. They don't even smell like fire when they come out. The mighty men, the mightiest of Nebuchadnezzar's army, they're consumed as they cast the three faithfuls into the burning fiery furnace. Yeah. Question. Did they try to get to know Jesus in the fire? Or did they know him and walk with him into the fire? Or did he walk with them into the fire? Did they all of a sudden feel the heat of the furnace and then suddenly decide it's about time I got to know God? What does that teach us? We need to know Jesus ready for trials. We shouldn't wait for trials to decide it's time that I need to get to know Jesus. Or it's time that I, I get to know Jesus. Yeah. What we need to do is get to know Jesus so that we're ready for trials. Sometimes Jesus will send a trial though because we don't know him. He wants us to wake up to the fact that we're in danger so he may allow certain things to happen to wake us up to that fact. Make sense? Yeah, and this is the thing. God is going to do all that he can to save us, but he can't force us to be saved. He'll love us into the kingdom if we allow him to. And what did God do because he loved us? Because he loves us? He gave his only begotten son, and he commends his love to us in the fact that, or to us in the fact that, while we get sinners, he did that. He didn't wait for us to ask him to die, he died, <coughs> that we might benefit from his death. Even before we asked, he did what he did. And that's a, a, a glorious thought. So Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3, he makes a decree, according to verse 29, and he says, having seen a miracle, having seen not just in chapter 3, but in chapters 2 and 1, evidence to prove that God exists. So this is a guy who believes that God exists. He's not an atheist. He's seen evidence to prove that God exists. And so not only has he seen evidence to prove that God exists, he's seen how mighty God is. In chapter 1, how does God reach out to Nebuchadnezzar? What does he use? What does Nebuchadnezzar become familiar with? And I'm reading between the lines here. When the four faithfuls are taken from Judah, to Babylon, that's Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're tested in different ways. <coughs> Their names are changed. But then they're given a provision, a daily provision of food. <coughs> Whose food are they given? <coughs> the king's food? 
and the wine which he drank. Does the king think that it's good food that he's given them? Yes, he thinks it's the best. He trusts in the food that he gives the faithful ones, but God uses Daniel and his three friends to show the king a better way. Yeah, they eat a different kind of food, healthy food. After three years, when the king tests all of the wise men, the ones who were taken from Judah, the ones who had been educated to become servants in Babylon, he tests all of them, and when he tests um, the four faithfuls, what does he find? They were ten times better than any, any, not just the captives who were taken from Judah, but any wise man in the kingdom, these guys were ten times better than. What's a wise king going to ask? Why is it that these guys are so good? What's Melzar, the head of their house, going to have to say? What's he going to have to own up to? Because when, when Daniel went to Ashpenaz and said, can we change our diet? Ashpenaz says, nah, because that will get me in danger with the king. So Melzar, he went to, Daniel went to Melzar, and Melzar said, okay. Daniel kind of said to him, give me 10 days, give us 10 days, and then test us. Melzar said, okay. After 10 days, Melzar saw that they were better. So he said, okay, you can eat the food that God prescribes for the rest of your term, uh, uh, your training um, schedule. After the three years, when Nebuchadnezzar tests them, they're wiser, smarter. God has blessed them with wisdom, skill, and understanding. Daniel with the ability to understand all dreams and visions. What's a wise king going to ask? Why is it that these guys are so much better than everyone else? Melzar's going to have to confess, and this is me reading through the lines, they ate differently. So what's the Lord reaching out to Nebuchadnezzar through? Diet, healthy food. So Nebuchadnezzar has been shown that there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a, a way to eat that, that's best for all, and that way to eat is found in the Bible. So the health message has reached Nebuchadnezzar. He has the health message. Does he follow it? We don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. We don't know. Doesn't say. But we can say that he was exposed to the benefits of it. Yeah. In chapter 2, what's Nebuchadnezzar exposed to? The power of prophecy, he has a dream, doesn't remember the dream, let alone the meaning, calls his wise men, people who he trusts. Remember in chapter 1 he trusts what he eats, God shows him a better way. Do we need to show the world a better way where diet is concerned? We do, for their sakes. We can't show them the better way if we're eating rubbish ourselves. Make sense? Yeah, that might sound hard, but it's true, isn't it? We need to eat good food. Who knows the best food for our bodies? The one who designed us, and that's God. So why do we have a problem when he tells us not to eat certain things? Maybe not here, but some people in church do have problems when God says, don't eat this or don't eat that. We'll say, why not? You know, who here drives a car? Have you got a manual to that car? When they tell you to put in um, diesel, do you put in petrol? Do you be a fool too? God says put in this, but don't put in that. But we say, ah... We'll listen to BMW and Saab and whoever else, you know, manufactures cars. But when it comes to listening to God, we have an issue. Does that mean that we maybe trust, you know, or we value our cars above the will of God? I don't know. That's a rhetorical question that you can answer in your heart. I'm not accusing anyone, but we have to be very self-reflective when it comes to our Christianity, don't we? The Bible says examine yourself, doesn't it? Second Corinthians 13 and verse 5. To determine what? Whether you're in the faith or not, what do we what are we very good at convincing ourselves of? That we're okay when we're not. The Laodicean believes that he or she is rich and increased in goods and has need of nothing. It's very symptomatic of Christians to believe that we're okay when we're not. In the upper room, when Jesus said to the disciples, You're all gonna betray me, you're all gonna be scattered, none of you are gonna stand by me. What what did Peter say? He said, Everyone will but not me. A little time after that, what did he do? Deny his, his Lord three times. Let him that thinks he stand. Take heed lest he fall. I'm not saying that to knock anyone. I'm saying that to say we need to realize just how much we need to trust in Jesus. And not in ourselves. What kind of hearts do we have according to Jeremiah 17 and verse 9? Wicked hearts. Desperately wicked. Deceitful above heavenly things. All things. We can't even trust ourselves. This is why we need Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Yeah? You know, when we talk about in Jesus' name, that's a big, big thing that we're talking about. It doesn't mean you fling his name at the end of a prayer. Everything that we get salvational, that's salvational, is because of Jesus. Make sense? In fact, we're saved because of the life that Jesus lived. Because as and when we ask for forgiveness, 
He forgives us and credits to our account the life that he lived. So we're all reliant upon that 33 years of history where Jesus was on the earth. Because the perfection that we require is the perfection of that life. Does that make sense? So as when we accept Jesus as our Savior and we ask him to forgive us, he credits to our account the life that he lived. And this is Ephesians 2 and verse 8. You are saved by grace through faith. We need to believe in Jesus as the one we accept him as our Savior. He credits to our account his life. Yeah, And the glorious thing that we can lean upon is the fact that he lived that life. Yeah, He didn't fail, he succeeded. And we rest upon his, his success, not our own. Remember, salvation is a gift of God. If you have to work for it, it's no longer a gift. Salvation is free, embrace it and believe that it's yours. And then follow the Lamb with us wherever we go. Meaning that you have to say, not my will, but yours be done. And where do we find the, the, Lord, the Lord's will? In the Word of God. Going back to Nebuchadnezzar, he was blessed by the health message in chapter 1. Saw how, the, how, how effective the health message is. In chapter 2, he has the dream. He, he, he calls upon the people who he trusts. And who does he trust? Who does he call? He calls the wise men. They aren't able to help him, are they? Yeah. And this is the thing. What God's doing for Nebuchadnezzar, he wants to do for us all. He wants to remove from our lives the things that we trust that aren't trustworthy. Make sense? And he does it in such a way where it's not too hard for us to have to deal with. He'll reveal to us the benefits of trusting in him and the, the, the dangers of trusting in the things of the world. Yeah? So the wise men come. Can they help him? He's frustrated to the extent that he says, I'm going to kill all the wise men. Because he realizes that they've been lying to him for the longest time. Whenever he was able to say, I've had a dream, and he could explain it, they would say, oh, this means this, and this means that. But he realized now that they have no connection to the gods because they weren't even able to tell him what he dreamt. And if gods are gods, then they should be able to do that. So he realizes, man, these guys have been lying to me for the longest time. I've been paying them to lie to me, so I'm going to kill them all. So he calls Ariok. And he says, go and kill all the wise men. Whose house does he turn up at first? Which is a, a, a blessing to the wise men, because they would all be dead if, if, if Ariok didn't go to Daniel's house first. So God's looking to save the wise men, even though the wise men have a problem with him. And that's how beautiful God is. Even when we had a problem with God, he still loved us. While we yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. And it's a good job he did that, because where would we all be if he didn't? Were any of us born Christians? We all have to accept Jesus. Even people who are born into the church have to accept Jesus, even though they're born and grown up in the church. So Ariok comes to Daniel's house. Daniel requests an audience with the king, goes to the king, and what happens? He's able to show the king the dream and the interpretation of the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar is, is there showing the benefits and the blessings of prophecy. And he accepts that God is a God of gods. He doesn't dismiss the existence of other gods, but he says, of all the gods, your God is the best, because he is a revealer of secrets. <coughs> yeah, so you can see Nebuchadnezzar has the health message. He also understands prophecy, because God reveals the only two things to him. He's very much like us, isn't he? In the sense that we as a church have been given the health message, and an understanding of prophecy. So what he was exposed to, we're exposed to. Do you, do you, do you see that point? So he's got what we have. No different to us in the fact that God has revealed the same thing to us as we revealed to him. So we're in the same similar position to him. Yeah? In chapter 1 he's convicted, in chapter 2 he's convicted, but hasn't he experienced yet? Conversion. Make sense? Are we functioning on conviction or conversion? Do we just believe? Conversion requires you actually doing something about what you believe. And the fuel of conversion or conviction or the faith that we require that's given us to us by is, is love. If you love me, keep my commandments. So it's vitally important that we see the love of God, that we accept and see clearly and embrace the fact that God loves us. That's vitally important with your Christianity, where your Christianity is concerned. If you don't believe that God loves you, then your motivation's going to be wrong. And why do you love him? <coughs> The Bible tells us because he first loved us. And we need to know how to behold the love of God. Because it's beholding that love that changes us and, and develops a love for him in us. Make sense? So where is the love of God manifested? 
and the cross. So it's important to understand what the build to the cross, Gethsemane just before the cross, and the actual experience of Jesus on the cross all represents, what it makes possible. The fact that God came and died, he literally died for us. Yeah, he didn't have to, did he? He was persuaded to because he is love. And he didn't die on the cross to show us that he was love. He died on the cross because he is love. Make sense? God doesn't love us to prove that he loves us. He loves us because he is love. Does that make sense? God does what he does because he is love. Not to show that he is love, but because he is love. Yeah, God really is love. And if you were to boil down the Bible to three words, it would be, I love you. God speaking to us. Why 66 books? Is it a failure on his part, or is it that we don't really listen? Do you follow my reasoning? God loves us. We need 66 books to tell us, because we're maybe hard of hearing. Yeah? And we don't believe it because of 101 different reasons. We often look at self, don't we, and not Jesus. We look at our own failings and measure what we can get from God based on what we have done. But remember, salvation is a gift. Yeah? It's like the woman who was caught in adultery. Yeah? What were the people expecting to happen to her? For her to be stoned, the ways of sin is death. What did Jesus say to her? I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Her motivation for not sinning, or in other words, keeping the commandments thereafter, was what? Love, because she recognized that she should have died, but Jesus said, no, I don't condemn you. But this is the thing, when we accept Jesus, we're in a very similar position to that woman. Have we all sinned? Romans 3 and verse 23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Chapter 6 says that the wages of sin is death, but the what? The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. When you embrace that gift, then you see the love that's connected to the, the, the fact that that gift is even there. You'll say, I'm going I'm I'm to keep God's commandments there. What's your motivation? Love. Because you recognize that you should be dead, but you're alive by the grace of God. When that woman went about doing right, having been freed by Jesus from condemnation. How, what, how would you do right thereafter? With a glum face or with a smile? Yes. With a smile? When the demoniac was freed of the 6,000 demons that were in him, when Jesus sent him into the capitalist, how did he go? Just been freed by, by the Lord, 6,000. You know, he was a joy to behold because he was joyful about his Christianity. In Psalms 51, David says, restoring me the joy of salvation, then I will teach sinners the error of their ways. We need to be happy about being Christians. You know, to be happy about being Christians, we need to know who God is. We need to accept that he really does love us in spite of ourselves. It's only when you realize that and embrace that that you'll do the commandments, you'll keep the commandments in a way that's accepted by God. Commandments won't be a, a, a burden. First John 5 verse 3. This is the love of God that we do what? Keep his commandments. His commandments on. We're not bothered about the Sabbath. Saying, oh man, it's Sabbath. We say, yes, it's Sabbath. And we're not looking at the end of the day thinking, man, sunset soon here. I can do my own thing then. We don't want Sabbath to end because we're spending time with the one that we love. Make sense? That's what Sabbath is all about. It's a little slice of heaven. Forever in heaven we'll be with God. If Sabbath ain't a delight, then when you get to heaven, what's it going to be like? Man, this is just like going to church every seventh day. It's boring. You won't like heaven. But there's a thing that we need to embrace here. We need to make sure church is like heaven. We can't, you know, it, 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 is heaven like church or is church like heaven? Yeah, church should be like heaven. Make sense? So in order to understand how church should be, look at the text to reflect how heaven is. Make sense? Do you follow my reasoning? Yes. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar is exposed to the health message, to prophecy, and then in chapter 3 he sees a miracle. He makes a decree that everyone, when they hear the music, should bow down to a golden image, which is a replica of the image that he had described to him that he dreamt about in chapter 2. He says, when the music plays, you almost bow down. He hears that three Hebrew boys don't bow down. Yeah? He calls them and says, look, I'm sure that when the music plays again, you'll bow down this time. And they say, we're not careful to answer you in this matter, old king. We're not going to bow down. Our God is able to deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. Or in other words, they're saying, if we have to die that you might be saved, then so be it. Make sense? They are walking into that situation, as I mentioned earlier, with Jesus. Then all of a sudden, hearing of the decree and thinking, man, it's about time I get to know Jesus now. They enter into that experience with Jesus. It's like in chapter 6 of Daniel, 
When it says that Daniel heard of the decree that you can't pray to any other god that, than Darius for 30 days, it says that he knelt down and prayed toward Jerusalem as he did a four time. The law that was made in relation to the lion's den didn't change Daniel, it amplified what he already was. Are the things ahead of us that are going to be a testing time for us? Yes. There are. We can't wait to that time, until that time, to start doing what we ought to do. We need to do it now. Today, hear my voice. Hard <coughs> not your heart. We need to do, when certain laws are passed that go against the law of God, what we did aforetime. <coughs> so what we do now will be amplified then. What we preach now will be amplified then. We need to warn people about what's coming. So that when it comes, I'll say, oh, you guys were speaking about this. We thought that you were talking rubbish at the time, but then we see. Jesus says, I tell you these things before they come to pass, and when they come to pass, you might what? Believe. We have a more sure word of prophecy that's the light that shines in a dark place. Yeah, read through first, second Peter chapter 1, I think it's verse 19. <clears throat> we need to talk to people about prophecy before <coughs> prophecy is fulfilled. With hindsight, it's not as powerful. You can say, yeah, that was prophesied in the scripture, what happened the other day. People say, are oh, you just twisting that to make it fit? But if we say it before it happens, then people can't argue, can they? That's the more sure word of prophecy. Make sense? So we need to understand what's left to be fulfilled, and we need to tell people about it in a loving way. Make sense? Yeah? Nebuchadnezzar comes to chapter 3, he sees the miracle, he sees Jesus deliver the um, Hebrew boys from their fiery furnace experience. Jesus says, consider it not strange, the fiery trial. Their fiery trial revealed who to the people looking on? Jesus. He was there with them, but they didn't see him until the trial. The Jesus, does, do people see Jesus when you're going through your trials? Or do you just complain about them? What does James say? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Don't moan about them. Because the trying of your faith work of patience. So we need patience because Revelation 14 and verse 12 says, here is the... If you, want, if you ask God for patience, what's he going to send you away? Things that will try your patience. You're asking for strength, he's going to send you something to live. Make sense? We need to get to a point where we don't complain when trials come our way. Yeah, trials are either instructive or corrective. Instructive in the sense that God's trying to show you something for the first time. Corrective in the sense that God might have shown you something, but you've gone back to the foolishness that he showed that you, you was wrong. Does that, do you follow that reasoning? Yeah, so we're going to have to go through some trials, but we can't wait to get to know Jesus during the trial. We need to know him ready for the trial. He will send us trials, though, to help us to realize that we don't know him. Yeah? Why does he do that? Because he loves us. We shouldn't complain about, about what God does because he loves us. Yes? Yeah? And this is the thing. There's a, a great trial ahead of us that we need Jesus for. We can't wait until that great trial before we get to know him. We need to know him now. And the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is, as Nebuchadnezzar looked into the burning fiery furnace, he said, I see a fourth, and the form of the fourth is like under the Son of God. Yeah? He ran to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and says, you know, shout out Meshach and Abednego, come forth. They came out. There's a glorious truth that's often missed there. When Nebuchadnezzar got to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, he should have died because the, white, the mighty men who carried them to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, they were killed. Nebuchadnezzar was saved though. So there were four people saved from the fire. Daniel's three friends and Nebuchadnezzar. He, that is Nebuchadnezzar, was saved because he saw Jesus. Make sense? And people need to see the Jesus that we serve when we go through our trials. Not complaints, we need to glorify the Lord. Make sense? Because Christianity is an, ab an absence of trials. It provides strength during the trial. I used to think that I'd get a sin-proof vest when I was baptized. As, as in, I wouldn't get tempted again. But I not, now know that having been baptized, temptation intensifies because the devil puts a target on you. You say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it's like Job. Whenever you accept Jesus, you Job. You know, when Satan went, went in Job chapter 1 to the meeting in heaven and, and God said to him, where are you coming from? He said, I'm coming from the earth and walking up and down on it. Yeah? And what, what, what does God say? He says, have you considered my servant? Put your name there. Remove Job's name and put your name there. And what does God say about, or rather, what does Satan say about Job? He only serves you because you protect him. If I... He won't if, let me trouble him and see if he still protects you. Or rather, let's see if he still worships you. 
Whenever you put yourself in Christ, you're a Job, you're going to get targeted. And who is looking on when you're being targeted? Who is looking on where Job's experience was concerned? The sons of God who were there for the meeting. When God said, have you considered my servant Job, not only Satan, but those people also considered him. Make sense? This is why 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9 says, we're respectful <coughs> unto the world, unto men and angels. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 3 and verse 10 says that we are here to reveal the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Angels are looking on to see the love of God as it's manifested toward us when we go through our fiery trials. Not only does Nebuchadnezzar see Jesus, but the angels see a revelation of Jesus' love too. Make sense? Because of us, when we're faithful, angels learn about the love of God when they see our faithfulness during trials. Or more so, God's faithfulness because of our faithfulness devil toward him. Make sense? There's a great work for us to do. On Desire of Ages, page 24, it says that our little world is a lesson but to the universe. And we're the subject matter. Yes? Nebuchadnezzar sees that God exists, chapter 3. But look at his response to his conviction. He says that if you don't serve God, I'm going to deal with you. Yeah? Remember, he's got the health message. He understands prophecy. He's seen Jesus. Yeah? Have we got the same three things? Are we like Nebuchadnezzar, though, in the sense that we try and force people into accepting God? Are we the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3 in the sense that we threaten people if they don't accept God? If you don't accept God, you're going to burn in hell forever. If you don't accept God, you're going to be cursed. We can't be the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3 because that doesn't persuade people to, 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 to want to know God. You can't force people to accept the gospel. You can't be too forceful when coming with the gospel to people. You can't be the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3. What happens to Nebuchadnezzar is described in chapter 4. Now when you look at the contrast between the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3 when compared to the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 4, what does he use to try and persuade people in chapter 4? He says, let me show you what God has done for me. He uses the love of God. He tries to use force in chapter 3. It doesn't work. You know, you, you, we, what we, need to, we need to get to know God. What's Nebuchadnezzar's problem? When you read through chapter 4 in your own time, you'll see that God has been reaching out for him or to him for the longest time. He has a dream in chapter 4 of a tree. What happens to the tree? It gets cut down. He calls the wise men again. Shows us that, that we sometimes keep going back to the things that we ought not to trust. Why? I don't know why. It's a strange one. The angels must look at us and think, man, they're back there again. And sometimes we, we go back to foolishness and we even of ourselves say, I'm back here again. How many times have you had to pray confessing the thing that you've done before that you promised God you'd never do again? You know, praise God for his mercy and the fact that he is, he is really long-suffering to us. We're not willing to let him perish. So Nebuchadnezzar, he is confronted with the truth brought to him by Daniel, because eventually Daniel comes in and the king is happy. He says, you're the tree, and if you don't humble yourself, you're going to be cut down. Nebuchadnezzar, read through the story yourself. You'll see that he's given a year's worth of probation every time. To put, he says, you need to break off your sins in righteousness. That's what Daniel says. You don't have to be cut down if you do the right things. Yeah, you've got enough evidence to prove that God exists. Act upon the, the things that you've seen God do. Just accept him. What do we find Nebuchadnezzar doing after the year, though? Walking on the walls of his great city. What do we hear him say? Is this not great Babylon that I have built? So what, what's he consumed with at the end of his probation period of time? Self. So what hasn't he given up? Self. So he's convicted. He's not given up self, though. So he's not converted. Conversion is you saying, not my will, but yours be done. It's you saying, Christ working, we both are willing to do with your good pleasure. Conversion is all to do with giving up self. You know, the way that we win as Christians is to give in. The way that we win is we lose. We lose to who, though? To Jesus. Jacob wrestled with the angel. And it was only when he was defeated that he won. He won. It's the same with us. You need to let this mind be in you. That means to give up. Give in and say, Lord, not my will, but yours. But what are we conditioned to do? To fight. Give in and let the Lord have his will where you're concerned. Make sense? Nebuchadnezzar has to become a beast for seven years before he gets it. Yeah? Does God have to do that to us? Maybe. Maybe some of us are going to have to eat grass for seven years. Yeah? Because we, we don't hear very quickly, do we? 
and I'm one of the people who takes a long time to hear. So Nebuchadnezzar, after the seven years of being a beast, read for the story, he comes to himself, he's restored to his throne, then he writes chapter four, and that chapter four was written by Daniel, it's Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. Yeah, and look at what he says. In chapter three, he says to all people, nations, and languages. In chapter four, he says it to the same people, um, people, nations, and languages. Then in closing, we have a message to preach to people, nations, and languages. Revelation 14, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to who? Same set of people. What's the message? Fear God. And give glory to him. Why? For the air of his judgment is come and worship has made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fences of waters. Second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and so on and so forth. Third angel's message warns against the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and so on and so forth. We can't present those messages effectively if we're the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3. We have to be the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 4. By that I mean we have to have surrendered that God might enable us to lovingly present these messages. And not only present them, but live them. The gospel has to be preached and lived and lived and preached. If you're trying to sell something and you don't know anything about the something, then no one's going to buy it from you. You don't turn up as a salesperson to someone's door and say, buy this from me, I've never used it myself. Don't it to you. You're going to have to test the product. We need to know Jesus that we might sell Jesus. Not that you have to buy Jesus, but you know what I mean. We need to be the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 4, in order to preach the three angels' messages effectively. And that's what it's all about. It's all about the love of God. Nebuchadnezzar got it in the end. We have to get it. Hopefully most of us have, if not all of us. I pray that we all get it if we haven't. We need to be the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 4, not the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3. We can't force people to embrace the gospel. We need to show people the love of God. We need to show people what God's done for us. Make sense? We need to tell people about what God wants to do for them. Yes? We need to reveal to people what's going to happen prophetically. Because we've been blessed with a lot of light as a church. Yeah? We can't keep it to ourselves. So be the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 4, not the Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 3. And God bless you all. Amen. Amen.